Welcome back and thank you for sticking with me. You're doing really well. We're now on video number four of evolutionary milestones and we're kind of starting to look at the point where life really takes a hold on Earth. So everything to this point has been in the Archean Eon. This is an eon which lasted from 4,000 to, oh, well, to about 2,500 million years ago. Bear in mind that has nothing to do with Archaea, the organisms, apart from etymologically and linguistically. They share the same origin as shown here. The ancient Greek um, Archaea means ancient. Um, so we have this Archaeon Eon um, where everything we've been looking at so far occurred. But we're moving on from that now to the next major period in life history. So shortly after what I presented earlier as potentially being the first fossils, uh, things called stromatolites start appearing. These are structures that are associated with bacterial mats. And ex an example from Estonia is shown in this image here. They have this really distinctive kind of wavy structure of different layers that you can see when you split through a rock. And if you look at a, a bedding surface, so at the kind of down onto the rock, you'll often see these um, kind of mounded uh, this mounded appearance. These structures are represented with bacterial mats, um, which are probably um, a result of uh, some form of prokaryote trapping layers of calcium carbonate as they grow upwards, possibly to towards getting uh, towards a light source to power a pho photosynthetic um, reaction of some form. I note that some recent papers have been published that suggest that these structures, stromatolites, appear very, very early. So some of them uh, in recent years have been suggested to exist at 3.7 billion years ago. But actually my two cents is that it's very hard to prove unequivocally or indeed to, um, to even make a, a case that it's more likely than not that the earliest stromatolites are biological in origin. There are a few different ways that this kind of structure could have built up that doesn't necessarily rely on bacteria to help make it. What I would highlight though is that widespread stromatolites appear at about 3.4 billion years ago and they're really really common by about 3 billion years ago and this suggests that we can make a case that's quite robust for widespread bacterial colonization of earth from around 3,000 million years ago. Now, I've talked about these structures, and obviously it would be nice for you to be able to see some. So I've put some 3D models of these structures on the site um, just below this video. Please do take a look at those to become a bit more familiar with what these things look like. And bear in mind, that they're really cool. These are the earliest macroscopic evidence for life on Earth. The first thing you can pick up in your hand and be like, you know what, that is the result of life on this planet. So I think it's really, really cool. Stromatolites are relatively rare today. They're found in a place in Australia called Shark Bay, and that's where this photo comes from. These are some modern stromatolites. And today, these are structures that only develop in environments that nothing else can survive, um, such as high salinity bays or lagoons, for example. That's because today, things love to eat the kind of bacteria that could have created a stromatolite, whereas on early Earth, there weren't other organisms such as invertebrates grazing um, early prokaryotes, um, thus preventing the growth of stromatolites through grazing. So that's why they were very widespread in the past, but are quite rare today. But we can study these examples that are around today to better understand them. So another thing to consider when we're thinking about early Earth is whether there has always been free oxygen or O2 in the Earth's atmosphere. Today, we kind of take it for granted. You and I are breathing it right now. I sincerely hope we're breathing it right now. Otherwise, that could be quite problematic. Um, and it seems that it will be um, the kind of thing that has been there forever. But actually, I can tell you that in answer to this question, whether there has always been free oxygen, the answer is no. Free oxygen um, lagged the appearance of life by some amount of time. The, the earliest evolution of life occurred in anoxic conditions. So that forces us to then re think about how oxygen could have started building up in Earth, up on 
uh, in Earth, in Earth history. So oxygen started building up at some point in the Archaean in Earth history. And the, the buildup of oxygen in the atmosphere resulted in a thing called the GOE, or the Great Oxygenation Event, sometimes called the Great Oxidation Event, or variations thereof. The GOE requires the evolution of photosynthesis of the type that's shown on this slide here, or something related. This is a reaction that takes carbon dioxide and water and uses energy from the sun um, to convert these two into sugar, uh, complex sugar and free oxygen. And that's the origin of free oxygen on Earth. So in order for oxygen to start building up on Earth, this kind of reaction must have evolved within some form of life. It's plausible that photosynthesis may have paralleled the development of the stromatolites that we just met in early Earth. But it may well be that early photosynthesizers used sunlight in a slightly different reaction to the one that I just showed you. What I can tell you is that the GOE began really around 2.5 billion years ago, and it's marked in the rock record by the appearance and the increase in red oxidized rocks, such as those that are shown on this slide here from Northwestern Australia. These are an example of a thing called a banded iron formation that appears um, as soon as there is oxygen to start reaction, reacting with the iron in the ocean. So these are red oxidized rocks related to free oxygen. And at the same time that these things appear, there are, this is a global phenomenon. There are large numbers of banded iron formations that occur around 2.5 billion years ago because the iron in the ocean is, is being oxidized. And as a result, we see the disappearance of minerals like iron sulfide, pyrite, or fool's gold, which are really easily oxidized. So that marks this kind of really distinct start of free oxygen appearing that we can see in the rock record. We think cyanobacteria are the first organisms to have evolved photosynthesis that releases O2. And certainly we can say that things like plants come much later in geological history. And spoilers, they actually make use of cyanobacteria for this. More on that later. Thus, cyanobacteria or the ancestors thereof probably caused the GOE. Um, the exact timing of this is, and the uh, appearance of free oxygen is still debated. But I would say that current evidence favors a pre-GOE origin of photosynthesis as represented by these arrows on this diagram showing time on the x-axis against the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere on the y-axis. You can see that from early in Earth history, oxygen um, concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere were very, very low. But we start getting evidence after three billion years ago in individual kind of um, rocks um, scattered around the globe that there was a local production of oxygen starting to occur. We think though that um, there we've got this pre-GOE origin and then a lag before free accumulation, sorry, before the accumulation of free oxygen in the atmosphere. And that lag after this point here would have occurred due to buffering reactions that used up early free oxygen such as the reduction of hydrogen, carbon, sulfur, and iron that we see in the rock record. What we can say, though, is that then there is this kind of burst shortly after 2.5 billion years ago in which the um, levels of oxygen in the atmosphere really increased quite significantly and quite quickly before a very long period of, of relatively little change in oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, sorry, of the concentration of atmospheric oxygen um, before another bump about half a billion years ago. That jump in oxygen um, that I've just talked about marks the beginning of the Proterozoic Eon. And that's the eon that spans from the appearance of oxygen at about 2.5, 2.4 billion years ago to the appearance of animals at somewhere around 541 million years ago. So that's the Proterozoic Eon. And Fossil deposits of single-celled life are smattered throughout this time period, the Proterozoic. I've got one example of, um, on this slide for, um, of fossils from this time period. That's the 
1,870 million year old gunflint formation. So these are fossils from a rock um, that were collected um, in Lake Superior in Canada. And I've included these in this video because they're a really good, notable example of a Proterozoic ecosystem that has been preserved in the fossil record. In fact, we often use them as a benchmark for Precambrian cellular preservation. So these are fossils of individual cells of things that were alive around 1,800 million years ago. Isn't that cool? I think that's really, really cool. In this deposit, there are a high number of individual microfossils. We see this big diversity of a form that's reflected in all of the images that you can see here, which I've provided a source for at the bottom of the paper from the PNAS. Um, and these range from filamentous bacteria, such as this one that's shown here, so it's long and like a filament, to spherical ones, such as the ones shown at the bottom here that are quite rounded in shape, to star-shaped um, bacteria, such as those shown at the bottom right here, onto a range of structures that are really quite unlike anything that's alive today. And they are typically described in this euphemistic sense of being as of unknown affinity. This thing on the top right is called Eosphera, and we just don't know what it is, but it does look like a slightly more kind of um, a complicated cell structure than many of the other um, fossils that we get from this time period. So that, the Gunflint Chert, shows um, is an example of the, the rich fossil record that we do get appearing at times um, during this Proterozoic Eon. Um, so it, it's just that life is getting gradually more complicated through this long period of time in Earth history. And in our next video, we're going to look at um, how um, multicellular um, organisms might have evolved and some of the challenges that organisms face once they become multicellular as well. So I'll see you there very shortly. <laughs>